Today is Palm Sunday. I was just talking to Robinson. I said, do you remember where we were four years ago, Palm Sunday? I was in Pakistan, and we just finished uh, some meetings in a secure location. And I told Robinson, when I come over there now, don't do a lot of publicity. Don't do this. And then I got there, and there were signs as big as this room with my picture on them. And so, uh, and sure enough, the police liked me so much, they came to the hotel, and they wanted me to go to the police station. And I was scared to death. I am not kidding. But Robinson went down there instead of me, and, and, uh, and he took a, picture, a copy of my passport with numbers blotted out. And that will get your attention when the police comes to your hotel and say, we want you in Pakistan. And then that night, we went out to preach at a church, and we had to walk through a wall of people. I mean, just a throng of people. And they were beating drums, and they had palm branches, and, and I was the guest of honor. And so we were walking to the church, and you had to walk through this crowd of people. And I wasn't really nervous until I saw the armed guards around me, and they were, they were nervous. And then I was walking a little fast, and one of them said, don't walk ahead of us. And I thought, okay, this, you are not in Kansas anymore. And so, uh, but anyway, it was an amazing time, a great time. And today's Palm Sunday again. Now, I'm going to share some things with you. I'm going to talk about living in a parched land, and then I'm going to talk about knowing. Uh, I was reading this week just some stuff, and I was reading in Psalm 68, and I'm going to share this first, and then I'm going to share something that God shared with me about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, maybe 15, I, I lose track. And, and then this week, one night when I was awake, God was speaking to my heart, and He said, I want you to share this again. And I said, Lord, I've shared that. And He says, yes, but you know more now than you did then. So I'm going to share some things that God spoke to my heart a while back, and He renewed it. In Psalm 68, 6, it says this, God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in parched land. Only the rebellious uh, dwell in parched land. Now, living in this parched land is living in a land of choice. Did you hear what I said? If you live in a parched land, you're living in a land of choice. Now, I wrote this little paragraph, and I'm going to share the paragraph, then we're going to talk about it a little bit. The parched land that the people are living in, the rebellious, is exactly the same land that others are living in that believe. It's the same land. So what makes it different? What makes it parched for one and a land of prosperity for others? What is it? It's the same land. It's the same land that others live in, but they refuse to see the beauty and love around them. What has been given to one has been given to all, Darwin. But some do not see it. Others don't want it and reject it altogether. And it's like the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Who did He die for? All. For all men. Who does He love? All men. Do all men know that? No. Do all, and, and sometimes even those that know it don't like it because they really don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And so when people are rejecting the prosperity of living in the land that Christ has redeemed, they're doing it by choice. Well, it's the same land for all. And this, this perception in people's mind is what changes it. God changed people from prisoners into prosperity. And the rebellious are living in the parched land because they choose either not to believe, and by the way, believe and obey are synonymous. They choose not to obey by believing. The Bible says that God causes the rain to fall on the wicked and the good. Now, a few years ago, a Bible study started where Darwin is, with the farmers praying for rain. When it rained, did it rain on those who believed and unbelieved? It rained on everybody, didn't it? It's the same with the blessings of God. They are for everyone, even though they don't know that. Now, these are metaphors, the, the rain and all of these things, but God causes the rain to fall. In, in Psalm 6, uh, 68, verse 19, it says, Blessed be the Lord, who is our salvation. Who is the Lord's salvation for? For all men, that's right. And then in verse 20 it says, God is a God of deliverance, and to God uh, the Lord... 
let me read it again. God is, God is to us a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong uh, escapes from death. I read that a little bit wrong, but, but the bottom line is what God has done for one, He's done for all. Well, some years ago, my brother Neil and I had gone to meet a guy who was on TV, and uh, I had a shirt on that said Grace Walk. He looked at that shirt and said, I don't like that. He said, what don't you like? He said, I don't like that grace stuff. I said, you don't like that? This guy's pretty famous. And he said, nope, people believe like that. They just go do anything they want to. And I thought, really? Well, let me share some things that I want to do. I want to believe God. I want to know how I'm loved. I want to, I want to share this message that God loves all men with everybody. And he was saying, if you believe in grace, then you're just going to go sin and go crazy. And, and that's the mindset of a lot of people. And it's really, really sad. Well, he gave me a book, and I came home, and I was reading the book. And some things in the book I really liked. And it was, this guy is a completed Jew. Uh, I won't tell you his name because people on here would know who it is. But uh, I was reading the book, and I thought, this is so exciting. And I remember Johnny was already asleep, and I got into bed. And... Uh, pulled the cover up, and I heard somebody said, say, no. And I knew it was K-N-O-W. And it was so loud, I almost woke Johnny up and said, did you hear that? And, uh, and I'm laying there, and I hear it again, no, K-N-O-W. Then I said, is that you, Lord? And he said three things to me, and, it was, and then a fourth. He said, know who I am. Then he said, know who you are in me. And then he said, know that I love you. And then he said, don't remember who you were because that's not who you are anymore. And then I said, you know, you've got to be spiritual. If God's talking to you, you've got to be spiritual back. That's what I thought. And so I said, well, if I don't remember who I was, I won't want to see people saved. And then it was like laughter from heaven. And he said, yes, you will. Because you think like me now. And I, I'm in the saving business. I want to see people saved. And so I got up that night, and Darwin, you remember the next day I came to a Bible study, and I shared it at Darwin's Bible study at 6.30 in the morning with some men. And I've shared this message around the world. And this week, I was up, and I wasn't sleeping very well, and, and uh, truthfully, I was worrying about stuff. You know, I know I shouldn't, but I'm probably not as spiritual as most of y'all, and sometimes I do worry. And uh, I'm sure I'm not as spiritual as David, because I doubt you ever do anything like that. But anyway, God said, you remember when I shared that with you? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I want you to share that again. And I said, well, Lord, why am I going to do it again? I've done it. He said, you know more now than you did then. You know more. Used to, I would spend more time talking about my part in this, knowing who I am. And that is a good thing, to know who you are. And then I would spend other part. But this time, I want to spend more time time talking about who he is knowing who I am once you understand who God is and his relation to you knowing who you are is no problem I try to convince people who they are in Christ and they don't hear me but when I begin to tell them who Christ is and who God the Father is and who God the Holy Spirit is and what he has declared to be so and what he has said and done and finished Knowing who they are is no problem. The reason people don't know who they are, and I want you to listen, is because they don't know who God is. They think God is some scorekeeper in heaven. You do this, He'll do this. They think God has an if-then clause. If you do this, then I'll do this. But if you don't do it right, then I'm not going to do it. Or worse still, if you do it wrong, I'm going to come down on you. And that's what people think. They think God's going to judge you for that. And they don't know that Jesus is God. And he said, I did not come to judge, but to seek and to save. But he said, but you've been judged already by yourself because you will not believe. The judgment is unbelief. And it's a choice. It's a choice to live in a parched land. Well, I began to think, okay, and I was writing down some things again fresh. I want to know who you are. He said, know who I am. Well, in Matthew 21, 9... And I'm going to flip over to it. In Matthew 21, 9, I shared this verse last year. But I'm just going to, I shared more than what I'm going to do today. But I'm just going to share this one thing. Do you remember when Jesus was going into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? 
and he was going down. You, you've been on that road. Y'all have been on that road where he's going down. And I was down there too. And it's a little, not much of a road. And it's still there. And you've got olive trees on the left. And you've got this road going. They always say going up to Jerusalem. But you're actually going down from, uh, for, you know, from uh, Mount Olives down there. And you're going down into the city. And they were laying their coats on. And they were laying branches of uh, palm branches down. And they were saying one word. And by the way, this is one of the two places that's used in the Bible. And they said the words, the same word we use today, Hosanna. 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 They did not know what they were saying. And I asked people, I say, what does Hosanna mean? And they say, well, it means saves. He saves. That was really a secondary meaning. Do you know what the word Hosanna means? It means propitious. Propitious. It's saying when they were laying those palm branches down and they were shouting out, they were shouting out the propitious one. They didn't even know what they were saying. They did not know. It was God literally putting thoughts in their mind, words in their mouth, and they were crying it out in propitious. And say, what's the big deal about propitious? Well, propitious means it's an exchange. He talks about this in Romans chapter 3. When He is the propitious one, when He literally became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. When every year, and I'm going to talk more about this, they would go into, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they would go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest would, with a rope tied around his back in case he died so they could pull him out, and they would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. You know what they call the mercy seat? Propitiation. That was the name for the mercy seat. That was a representative of the shed blood of Christ. This started in the garden. This propitiation started in the garden. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. God did not hide from them. His name is Yahweh, the one they were walking with. You know who that is? Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. That was the name used. I am Elohim. I am God. And the word Elohim is plural. The, the Godhead. The, the, the triune Unity, the, uh, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God created man in His image and He breathed life into man. And then man sinned, willfully chose to disobey. He believed through Eve that he had to do something to be like God. He is the propitious one. They no longer needed the mercy seat because they had the real thing. The Bible talks about him being the son of David. He's the son of David. It's a picture. The Bible calls him the Alpha and the Omega. It was finished before any creation took place. He's the beginning. He's the end. But you know, in time there is no beginning. And there is no end. He is the I Am. I've already said that. John 8, 58, before Abraham was born, I Am. He's the one who breathed life into man, Genesis 2-7. When He created the animals, He created them alive. They had life physically. But when He created man, He did something He did not do with the animals. The Bible says He breathed life into man. And I asked this question, whose life did He breathe into man? His life. The one who sought Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned, that's who He is. Adam and Eve disobeyed. He's the one that restored. He sought them. They didn't seek Him. He's the one who gave a picture of His coming shed blood in the garden with the shedding of the innocent blood of the animal. He is the covenant maker with Abraham before His name was Abraham when He called Him Abram. Somebody wrote on Facebook the other day and he couldn't have been more wrong. And sometimes I see these things and this is through the seminary that we're a part of. And he said, when, when God made a covenant there with Abram, that was the old covenant, and now we have a new covenant. And I go, whoa, Jack, that's not right. Grace existed long before there was any law. The covenant that God made, quote unquote, with Abraham was not a covenant God made with Abraham. It was a covenant that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit made among themselves on behalf of Abraham. Abraham was in a sleep. He had nothing to do with it. Not only was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit walking through the blood, not only were they the covenant maker, but they are also the covenant keeper. You cannot keep the covenant and you never could and you were never supposed to because you can't and he knows that.
So He's the covenant keeper. Then it talks about it over in the book of Hebrews. It said without death, no will goes into effect. Do you know what the will, what that means? That word is covenant. Without a death, the covenant doesn't go into effect. And it's not your death, it's His death. God the Father sent the Son. God the Son willingly obeyed because He wanted to by literally becoming sin. The perfect man. He is the last Adam. So that you would be righteous. This is an exchange. And God the Holy Spirit draws you to the fact of this covenant. All three were involved in the covenant. Did Abraham believe? Of course he did. What did he believe? He believed all he knew about the covenant. But he couldn't even do that in his own power. God even gave him the ability to do that just like you. Well, he is the one who gave a picture of the shed blood. He's the covenant maker and the covenant keeper. And it wasn't old covenant. Put that out of your mind. There's one covenant. People say, well, there's the covenant of law. That's really not a covenant. That's saying, okay, here, keep all these things. If that's what you want to do, try that. And you say, I can't do that. And he said, I know you can't. So why don't we go back to the original covenant, the covenant that I made with the Godhead on your behalf. By the way, who was this for? Some people say for the Jews. No, no, no. At this time, there were no Jews. Do you know that? There were no Jews. He said, your seed, who is the seed? Jesus. He's the seed. And it says through Him and through you, the nations will be blessed. That's everybody. The blessing of the nations was on all men through Jesus. He's the seed. But we're in Him and He's in us. Okay. And this is kept by God through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. He's the last Adam. He's the last Adam. The first Adam sinned. The last Adam. And the word Adam means man. Christ is the representative man. The first Adam sinned. The last Adam was obedient. The first Adam sinned as a result. Condemnation to all men. That's Romans 5.17. The last Adam was obedient as a result, justification of life to all men. Romans 5, 8. He's the one. The, I love this verse, but God demonstrates God the Father, His own love toward you, and that while you were a sinner, Christ loved you. When did, when did they love you? Well, yeah, but you were sinning, yeah. <clears throat> And then in Romans 5.10, uh, let me flip over to Romans. This is, I'm going to read it from, this is the New Holman translation, which I've been using lately. And it's a very, very good translation. I love the King James. I love the New American Standard. But we're going to use this one today. And it says in Romans, uh, I said that's 10. We want to go to 5. In Romans 5.10, listen to this. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. When were you reconciled to God? while you were an enemy. Before you'd done anything, you were an enemy. You were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, the propitiation. Then how much more having been reconciled, listen to this. I like it in the Spanish. I love to say this when I'm in Mexico. Mucho mas, much more, will we be saved by His life. We're not even saved by believing. We're saved by His life. What do we believe? We believe that we were saved by His life. This is what the Bible says. We think that we have something to do with salvation. We don't. We believe it. People don't know the Bible. Tragically, they know what people have told them. But when they read it, they miss it. In verse 11, And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now, and this is a big word, received reconciliation. You see, reconciliation is given, but it must be also received. But who's it given to? The Bible says it. All men. Justification of life to all men. Such a big deal. Over in Romans 5, I said 18. Let me read it to you. So then, as through one trespass, the sin of the first Adam, there is condemnation for everyone. Who was under condemnation? In the, in the King James and New American Standard, it says all men. So also through one righteous act. What is that righteous act? It's the propitiation. It's the death, burial, and the resurrection. Through one righteous act, there's life-giving justification. In the King James New American Standard, it says justification of life for, and it says here, for everyone. In the New American Standard, it says for all men. 
The first Adam sin, condemnation. The last Adam, it says one righteous act, justification of life for all men. Did you know that? What do we believe? We believe that He has made me just and given me life. When did He do it? When I believe? No. That's what I believe. Has nothing to do with me. Do I need to believe it? Absolutely. But it is finished. Well, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, and I'm going to leave out so much stuff because time won't allow me to do everything. But in Ephesians 1, 4, it says that in love He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Before He created anything, you were chosen in Him. Even those that don't know it. Do they need to believe it? Yes. Can they reject it? Tragically, I believe they can. But they're rejecting what is truth. They're rejecting what is done. Justification of life to all men. You were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. And I have this question. I'm sharing everything which is about what He does, about who He is. If you were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, I have this one question. What part of that is your part? None. You don't have a part. He is the one, 2 Corinthians 5.14, He is the one that when He died, all died in Him. He says, when, when, when He died, all died in Him. I had a Baptist preacher tell me one time, and I really appreciated his honesty. He said, that verse has always bothered me. Because when you understand that when He died, all died, you, then you understand Romans 6, 4. It says in Romans 6, 4, and let me just, I'll, I'll read it in, uh, in this Translation, therefore we were buried with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too walk. In, in, in the New American Standard it says a newness of life, but here it says a new way of life. If you don't understand when He died, you died, then you won't understand the resurrection. You have been raised to walk in newness of life based on what He did. Because when one died, all died. Now, He's the one who became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, The one who knew no sin, talking about Jesus, talking about I am, talking about the one who literally created Adam and Eve in the garden. I am the one who's always had fellowship with man in the Old Testament. This is not an Old Testament thing. This is not a New Testament thing. This is a God thing. How that... It says, the one who knew no sin became sin so that we might become uh, the justification of life. So we might have justification of the rights. Thank you. So that, anyway, I'll get it in a minute. Uh, let me just read it. And it talks about the fact that, uh, that we have, here, let me just read the whole thing so I'll get it exactly right. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I'm sharing all these things with you about who He is and what He's done. And once you understand who He is and what He's done, then you can understand who you are in Him. And then I put at the bottom of this list, I put much more because there's so much more. And then I'm going to share the second thing that He told me that night. Know who you are in me. People don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know. They still think it's about them. They don't know it is finished. Well, I wrote down some things. Now, here's the first thing I wrote. I am all the things above that you are that you've given me. Do you know that everything that was Christ has been given to you? Everything. The Bible says that you are in Him and He is in you. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 4 that... that when He is revealed, you know, that you will be revealed in Him. It says that you, or He is your life. You will be revealed in glory. In fact, His glory is revealed in you. And do you know that you are glory to Him? Just like my grandchildren. I glory in my grandchildren and my children. I should say my children first, but let's face it, you like your children. Well, you like your grandchildren even better than your children. <laughs> you do. I'm sorry. It's the way it is. You love your children, but you really love your grandchildren. But the fact is, He glories in us, just like we glory in Him. 
Well, I am all the things above, and I wrote some of them down. I am completely loved. And it didn't start when I believed Him. It started before creation. I am holy. The word holy means to be set apart. It's the same word for saint. That's who we are. I am redeemed, bought, purchased. I am chosen from before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 2.6 I am seated in Him on His throne. I am righteous. And it says that throughout the Bible. I read it a minute ago. 2 Corinthians 5.17 I am made alive in Him. I am a son. I am not a slave. I am complete in Him. He is my life and much more. I am. Now this is amazing. Even though I don't understand this, I am the finished work of Christ. You say, now wait a minute. You still have issues. It looks like I do. I still deal with flesh on this earth. I still deal with flesh. How do I deal with flesh? By knowing I can't deal with flesh. What does flesh do? It must die. Here's the good news. It has. You see, God knows who you really are. We think we're how we act. That is not who we are. And the reason people act like they do is because they don't know who they are. Once they know who they are, they'll begin to act like who they are. But people try to get actions to determine identity rather than identity to determine actions. And that's why the world is in such a mess. And then we look at people, and you're seeing it in our political season right now. He's a Christian. He's loved by God. He's not a Christian. We can't have anything to do with anybody that's not a Christian. Boy, aren't you glad God didn't feel like that? Aren't you glad that God loved people not based on their actions? He loved people based on His actions. And when I was in, when I was in Pakistan, even flying over there, there was a guy on the airplane with me. He was, a, he was a, a, an orthopedic surgeon. And he was from the Sudan and he lived in Abu Dhabi. And he said, where are you going? With him for 14 hours, I thought. And I said, I'm going to Karachi, Pakistan. He got this funny look on his face, thinking, hey, we don't even go there. Then he said, why are you going? And I said, I'm going there to tell them how much Jesus loves them. And this, his name was Ibrahim. And he said, he thought about it a minute, and then he said, I like that. Now, this was a Muslim guy. And he says, when you come to Abu Dhabi, and you will, you stay with me at my house. Muslim guy. Then I said, I would love to. And I said, if you come back to Georgia, Ibrahim, if you come to Georgia and your conference here or something, stay with me. He said, I will. Now, I thought that was pretty cool. Muslim guy on the airplane that I didn't know. And he said, why are you coming? And I said, I'm going there to tell the people how much Jesus loves them. Notice I didn't say I'm going there to tell them about their sin. I'm going there to do this. I see on Facebook all the time, we're to preach against sin. Really? Really? How's that working? How's that working? Is that straightening people out? No! If you're doing that, stop it. Tell people who they are. Tell people, first of all, who He is. Once they understand who He is, the other things will take care of themselves. And then the third thing that He told me, know that I love you. And I used to begin thinking, okay, I've got to come up with a list of all the things. But He's already shown me. Once I understand who He is, I don't have any problem believing that He loves me. If you go up and you go to a church and you ask them, tell me about God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. Tell me the first thing that you think about them. What would you say first? What would you think most people would say first? I'll tell you what they wouldn't say first. They wouldn't say this, God is love. His nature is not just to love, but love. Everything, everything God does, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, comes out of His one nature, and that is to love. Everything that He does for everyone on this earth, even if they don't understand it, even if I don't understand it, comes from a love nature because that is His nature. Romans 5.8, I already shared it, but God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It is His nature. It's all that He can do. 
everything that he does, even that looks like it's not love, it is love. Does it feel like love when you were little and you got a spanking? Did that feel like love? No, but it is. You see, the Bible says God chasteneth those that He loves. And we think that is punishment. It is not. That is man's nature. That is not God's nature. Everything that God does for those He loves is ultimately for their good. There is a big difference between discipline and punishment. Punishment is to inflict, inflict pain. Discipline, it comes from the word disciple. It is to help you become who He says you already are. That is the nature of God. Now, all that I am is fully based on who He is. And I hope you begin to understand, whoever's listening here, that there's not an Old Testament covenant and a New Testament covenant. Somebody the other day said, the faith of Abraham, that was man's faith, but now it's not that anymore. Now it's God's faith. It's Jesus' faith. And it is Jesus' faith. But it was Jesus' faith with Abraham also. Abraham could not believe God without God giving him the ability to believe. It's finished from before anything. And if people don't understand this, they'll, they'll go through doing things. And I hear people talk about the, uh, in the book of the Revelation. People don't like the book of the Revelation. And some people say, how can anybody be a premillennialist? Well, I'm not going to get into that, but I'm going to tell you this. When you read in the book of the Revelation, everything that was going on in the book of the Revelation, it was because God loved man. It was not for punishment. People read that and say, he's just punishing. And they forget this one thing. Over and over in the book of the Revelation, it says, and they repented not. Now, there were many that did repent. And people say, that means change their ways. No, repentance doesn't mean change your ways. Repentance means to change your mind. What is it that you change your mind about? You go from unbelief to belief. That's why that stuff was going on in the book of the Revelation. Not because God was mad at people. That's just the way people think. God is mad. He's a mad God. And how tragic to go through life thinking that God is a mad God rather than God is a God who loves you. Try sharing this with people. Watch what happens. You want to see some changed lives? You tell them. You tell them who He is. You tell them who they are in Him. And you tell them that God loves them. You tell them that it is finished. You tell them it was finished before the cross. Now, he said it on the cross. It is finished. You tell them that they are the last thing. I haven't shared this yet. They are forgiven. Some people think and wrongly think, and they, they don't do it because they're bad people. They just don't understand. People think that they're forgiven when they ask for forgiveness. No. We're forgiven when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that was an aorist imperative. It's completed action, passive voice. You can't do anything to do that. So we believe who we are. We are the forgiven ones. We believe that it is finished. I believe that it is finished. But listen to this. In my life, it is not finished because I believe it. It is finished and I believe it. Do you understand the difference? If you understand these things, it will change your life. Next week, we're going to celebrate the risen Lord. But folks, this is just a day. We don't really know which day it was. In truth, we don't really know. But I'm telling you this. We celebrate the risen Lord every day. He was risen from eternity past. You see, in his mind, it was finished before he created anything. And we believe it. Well, I hope this has been a benefit to you. I love you. And uh, I'm not mad at you. If I get a passionate, it may sound like I am. I'm not mad at all. I'm just excited about the fact that He has done it all. And His love knows no boundaries. And I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know where you are. But I can tell you this. Jesus loves you. God the Father loves you. And God the Holy Spirit loves you. Never forget it. See you next time.